We want to thank you for joining us at Cowboy Junction Church today. As you hear this message, we pray that your faith will grow and you will be both encouraged and challenged. We would really love it too if you would subscribe, rate, review, and share this online. You can also help us reach others by partnering with us financially. You can easily give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift at cowboyjunctionchurch.com slash give. We hope you enjoy the message today. This is our last message on a series we've been doing called, What Does a Good Life Look Like? And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I, sometimes I look back and I think, it was about a three-week, four-week message, three-week series. It wasn't. It was a much longer series. This is a couple months worth of messages on what does a good life look like. Here's my hope, okay? My hope is that you begin to ask this question in your life. If you didn't get to hear all the messages and you're like, that's an interesting question, what does a good life look like? Well, go back. You can listen to them on our podcast, um, on Apple, on, um, our, on, on our website, on our app. You can download our app and listen to every one of them. If you're here today and you're like, I didn't get this series at all. I didn't. I, I don't know. I don't like that question. Go back and listen to them again. And I uh, promise, this is a question we've got to start asking ourselves. We really do. What does a good life look like? Okay, we've been talking about, started it off, we talked about how God knitted it all together. The, the thread of chukmah, that is the wisdom word that's bigger than the word wisdom. It's, it's how God made everything. It's how the kingdom of God functions. It's how he says to do things. It's how God works. It boils down to the ways of wisdom in which life should be lived and the way that you see a good life come out of this chukmah. Okay, we begin to talk about the wisdoms of God that lead to the good life. Um, today, I've saved what I would consider the most important one for me to today, okay? And um, I, in, the, in the past with these messages, I've, I've like broke down all kinds of different scriptures found in the books of Proverbs, book of Proverbs, that kind of shines a light on wisdom keys, okay? And, and today, I'm not going to do that. And the reason why I'm not going to do that is because there is one scripture that affected me many, many, many years ago when I was 19 years old and memorizing scripture, whatever reason it was, this scripture changed my life forever. Now, let me just tell you, it's not one of those aha scriptures. There's some that are in that said, that one changed your life. That's, that's what I'm talking about. When God deposits, deposits something into your life, truly, revelation is the very thing from God that makes you look deeper into something that you could just easily glance over. And that's what this scripture I'm about to show you is. So with it, let's, let's take a look at it. Here's what it says. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says this. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And today, Father, I pray that you would open our ears to hear and, Father, our hearts to receive. Jesus, this message is my life story. And, Father, today I pray you would tell the story of what you did in my life. Lord, I love you. I praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me just tell you, uh, living for the Lord is the greatest decision I ever made in my life. But with it, I'll let you know that uh, I can get dull. And uh, my buddy and I went fishing this year, and uh, I, I took him on a trip, blessed him, wanted him to come with me, and he gave me as a gift for taking him on the trip this, this fishing knife. I never received a fishing knife before. They were all work knives. And, and so I, I just thought that was really cool that he thought of me enough to give me this gift, this fishing knife. And, and uh, it's been kind of fun, but the thing that I've noticed about it is the day one that he gave it to me, it had quite the edge. I love a new, new knife. You guys ever notice how sharp a knife is when you get it? This is so. But there's this art. There's this art that I think is being lost 
in the world we live in today, and it's the art of knife sharpening skills. Your grandpa was good at it, remember? Uh, I remember sitting down with an old ranch cowboy in Pampa, Texas, and he, uh, he, he, he literally had the art, he, he called it the art of sharpening a knife. And he was so detailed in everything he did to get the process of a sharp blade. And, and, and the other day, my mom gave me an old box that belonged to my grandpa. His name was Jabo, J-A-B-O. That was my grandpa's name. Everybody needs a cool grandpa name. He was just born with it, Jabo. Okay? And old Jabo Rich was my grandpa. And, he, and, and in the old box was all these things I remember from my childhood. And this is my old whetstone, the old whetstone that Jabo had. I can't tell you how many hunting knives were sharpened on this whetstone. I can't tell you how many times he would pull it out and start telling me stories. He told me about the Korea War with this whetstone. He, he told me about life with this whetstone. Heck, we talked about girls with this whetstone. And, 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 and it was just this memory I have of how many times we sat down. But it was the art of sitting there and watching this old man show me how to sharpen a knife. I um, was watching a documentary the other day about sharpening knives. You know, life's so exciting when you're watching a documentary on, you're either getting old or you're just appreciating the finer things at the point to be watching 30-minute documentaries on how to sharpen a knife. And I love it every minute of it. It was so great. And it was talking about how chefs don't try to sharpen their knives. They have a professional come in. Then they showed how you keep the, 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 the blade sharp. The reason I'm going to bring up this illustration and show you is that our lives can get boring. Your, your walk with Jesus can get dull. This whole message today is about is there rust on your blade? Remember when you first got saved and you were just ecstatic? about this new life you found. Perhaps life happened and you just got busy. Things happened. Uh, we've all experienced this moment. One of the worst things that can happen is to turn to God and blame Him. It's not a turn to God and blame moment. This is when we have to stop and realize that maybe you're just a little rusty. You can't expect a blade to hold its sharpness when you don't put it underneath the whetstone. And there are whetstones in our life. The Spirit, now change it from a knife to this is your spiritual life. Okay? This is your faith in God. When was the last time you just allowed the Word to sharpen you? It just takes a few strokes. It just takes a few moments to sit back and pause. I probably shouldn't have done that. Huh? That, was, that was an old cowboy thing right there. Sorry. And, and, and to get the edge back. I'm going to talk to everybody in the room that you just feel like you've lost your edge. I'm going to talk to everybody in the room that you want to keep your edge. This scripture that we read a minute ago has everything to do with where are you and what is God doing with you. And it's the very scripture that transformed my life to make some of the most major decisions I would ever make in my life in the direction you see where I'm at today because I begin to ask some of the big, deep questions about my life. Not your life, not everybody's life, but my life. And my questions I had is, what is God's purpose for my life? What is the reason that I'm here? What is the purpose God has for me? And for whatever reason, that same week, one of my scripture memory verses was this. We'll put it back up there. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. This was a quick read, a quick blurt over. It became one of those scripture memory verses that I had to get because daily I had to get at least one to qualify for the graduation that was going to take place in the program I was in. And so the pro process began in, in the memorization. Now I would memorize a few words at a time. The fruit of the righteous, the fruit of the righteous, the fruit of the righteous, the fruit of the righteous is, the fruit of the righteous is, the fruit of the righteous is a tree. The fruit of the righteous is a tree. And this began the whole process. But then at the end, I found out that I had memorized the scripture but had not thought about what it meant. And I, I questioned, I wonder how many people had ever read this scripture and got the story behind the story. And we've been talking about this, believe it or not, for the last several weeks. What does the fruit of the righteous look like? The righteous. We're asking a question. What does a good life look like? What does the fruit of somebody's life that followed God's teaching and practiced his chukmah, what does the fruit look like of someone who chose the good life in our Father look like? 
Do you judge your fruit? Do you look at your fruit? Is your life producing fruit? And at 19 years old, I begin to ask the question, what kind of fruit is going to be said about my life? What can be said about my life? When I'm 46 years old someday, what fruit will have come from my life? Yeah. Whew, that's a deep question for a 19-year-old. But we dove in. It doesn't stop here. It says something really interesting. It says, And he who wins souls is wise. And we've been talking about wisdom. Now, there's two types of people in the room. There are people that your soul has been won. And there are those in the room that you're still working out what is salvation. But for every one of us, I want to focus on this today because I want to talk to you about this Super Bowl, Super Soul Sunday, if you will. I think I need to patent that, that phrase, Super Soul Sunday. Is that how she says it? I like Oprah. I don't care who you are. I like Oprah. Uh, and, and, and we're going to have our own Super Soul Sunday today. And with it, we're going to ask some questions. Okay? And the first question that I have for you is this. What is the greatest gift that you can give someone? Think about it for a minute. What is the greatest gift you've ever received from someone? What is the greatest gift you've ever given someone? And, and according to what we just read, there is this unpacking of what a wise life is, what good fruit is. And I want to throw the answer to you. This is my answer. I want you to think about this. What is the greatest gift you can give someone to care about their soul? Truly, now just stop for a minute. Don't miss this. I've been praying for you. I've been asking God to reveal this to you. But we're asking about a sharpness. We're talking about getting our edge back. And I want to ask you something very important. Are you a soul searcher? Are you a soul improver? Are you a soul rescuer? Are you a soul valuer? Have you put your heart in the presence of the ability to understand that the greatest gift you will ever give somebody is to actually care about their soul? And the flip side is this. One of the greatest gifts you will ever give yourself, and we've talked about it for the last several weeks without saying it this way, but it's something I want to think about. One of the greatest gifts you will ever give yourself is when you take your soul seriously. I'll, I'll pop it back out there and I'll show you again. It's going back to getting the edge back. And so many times we lose our sharpness because we don't focus on the incredible wisdom and fruit that comes from seeking out folks who need help with their soul. And the flip side is we take all the worldly things and we put them ahead of the most important thing. How's your soul? How's your soul? Like right now, how's your soul? How's your heart? How's your mind? How's your walk? How's your talk? How's your flesh? How are you? And it's all boiled down to how's your soul? Is it hurting right now? Is it confused right now? Is it dull right now? Does it have some, some rust on it? Or, or do we focus on the ability to recognize that fruit comes from the condition of a soul well lived? I've been looking at this for the last several weeks, and I just want to pay attention. One of the things we've talked about, and without talking about it, we're going to talk about it more and more in this next series we've got going on. But our goal as followers in Christ Jesus. Our goal into coming to church is not to go to church, but our goal is to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Fully. What does that mean? Completely and whole. Devoted. With, without any limitations. Devoted to. Followers. Where he goes, I go. And who is he? Christ. And to become fully followers, devoted followers of Christ is the goal of today. And I just want to tell you, it should not only be a goal in our life, but it should be the goal of the message that we are trying to share with those around us. Okay? So today, we're talking about a soul. And we're going to do something. I, I, I don't know if I've ever done this before. I, I've, I've done an, an acronym. Is it, and we, uh, we're going to talk about a soul. 
S-O-U-L, okay? And for us to get so healthy, and for us to see the world we live in get so healthy, there's four things. There's the S-O-U-L that I want to talk about today, okay? And the first one is this. We've got to be seekers. What is a seeker? In Proverbs 11, verse 30, it says, The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. The story of Zacchaeus is a fantastic little story you can read when you get home, okay? Zacchaeus is this wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to. Look at you little Sunday school kids right there. That is so good. Zacchaeus' story is an amazing thing because it gives us two types of seeks, okay? Two types of seekers. You see the story being told about Jesus, but you see Zac- Zacchaeus, who was ostracized, pushed away, began to be soul conscious. And one of the things you recognize about Zacchaeus' life is he sought out Jesus that day. He was a seeker. If you're in this room and you would say, my soul's not good, let me just stop you and let you know, church can't fix you. Pastors can't fix you. Christians can't fix you. They're tools in the toolbox. But the first thing is, we have to be a seeker of Jesus. I want to turn to you right now and say, if you came here today to fix something, everything you're doing is spot on. You're doing the right thing. But I want to kind of direct you and point you towards the light. Okay? And the light tells us this. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. Jesus happens to be a seeker too. But he's seeking those who are looking for the answer. So the first thing you see is Zacchaeus is hungry. He's seeking. But the second thing is Jesus is looking for him too. Zacchaeus climbs up in a sycamore tree because he wants to see Jesus. But Jesus sees Zacchaeus over the crowd and recognizes the seeking. Let me just, one of the greatest things you'll ever give anybody is your attention to help them seek better. And for my own life, I want you to know that people have become the priority for me. I find the most joy being around people. I also get the most hurt by being around people. It's the craziest thing ever. Sometimes I feel like I'm riding a freight train. And it's like we're, we're, we're going to bang if we go forward. And we're going to bang if we put on the brakes. We're going to bang, you know, bam, 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 bam. And that's what a train sounds like. That's what I feel like half the time as a pastor. We're going to bam if we move forward. We're going to bam if we move backwards. And sometimes you just get sick of the bam. I mean, bam. The, the, the thing you've got to stop and realize is there will be nothing in your life that brings you more joy than when you become soul conscious of the people around you. To want to be able to help, to care for, and, and interject the chukmah of God. To look like somebody cares. To have somebody who cares in your life. And so I, I have a question for you. Has anyone ever cared about you? And I bet they have. In fact, they may be, you may be here today because somebody cared about you. But the first thing we have to do to get our sharpness back is to care and to start seeking. I think we could be better seekers. The second thing is the O. When we start doing our part, our part, let me just show you something real quick. There, there's an R part, and there's a their part. So, so if you're on your pa- paper, you draw two circles, okay? And these two circles meet, and there's this little teardrop that happens right there. You're going to have people in your life that you start doing your part, but you can't do all the part. They have to do their part as well. But right here in the middle, there's a third thing that takes place. It's the God part. And when all three begin to unite, there's right in the middle of the sweet spot to where we do our part, they do their part, and God does his part, and there's a sweet part that happens in the middle. Does that make sense? And this is something for everybody to pay attention to. You have someone in your life trying to do their part. But the question you have to ask yourself, are you doing your part? And in the middle of all 
of that, are you depending on them to do their part for our part when you should be asking God for his part? And it's this balance we find that people can only do so much, but they begin to do their part, which is our part. I do my part. But if you rely on people to do their part all the time, and you're doing your part, but you rely on them to do their part, when you should be asking God to do his part, you're missing the sweet part of what God's going to do in your life. There is someone who's going to care, but there is someone that's there asking you to start caring about how God cares about your life. People can be the tool, but they're not the answer to the problem. God is. And are you living in the sweet part where there's just enough people and you're just available to allow God to do all he can to be the sweet part that God wants to do in the whole part of being soul conscious and soul healthy. I, I want to ask everybody in the room that you've just kind of lost your edge because you just quit caring. Yeah. Stop it. Get active somewhere. Get out of your house. Get involved someplace. There are people right now that five years ago you were so active in church. You were so active in church. You were busy in church. But then all of a sudden you begin to think, it is church where I'm supposed to be? And we should always be in church. There's something that God wants to do here. But he has a purpose for you out there. And I want you to be the light in wherever it is that God has you so that we can do our part in their part and his part to find the sweet part that God wants to do in your life. For my part, I absolutely love my CrossFit crew. Yeah, Eric's on the front row, 5 o'clock every morning. We are a bunch of idiots lifting weights, throwing stuff around, going for two-mile runs. It is the most awful thing I've ever done in my life, and at the same time, it is this beautiful seek and finding my part in this story of just turning to some friends, sitting down, being a complete flop sweat, and say, hey, how's your story with Jesus? And they go, what? And I go, no, seriously, how are you and Jesus? Sometimes they say, we're great. Sometimes they say, we're not doing that good. And all of a sudden, I play my part in their part to make them start looking at his part and all of a sudden, we've taken one step closer to find the sweet part of what God wants to do in their life. I drive home with tears in my eyes sometimes that I get to be a part of this big picture. I've called Heather on the phone saying, I have found my sweet part. I love pastoring my church. I love being the head of my household. I love discipling my children. But there is something spectacular when I step out of my comfort zone into places that I never thought I could be used. Dust the rust off and start being soul conscious. Quit putting all the focus on you and start asking yourself who Whose part are you want, wanting me to play in their soul consciousness? Okay? But the fourth, third one, the fourth, third one, you ready? S-O-U, it's going to get uncomfortable. Yeah. Guaranteed. There is nothing more intimidating than asking somebody how their soul is. There is nothing more intimidating than presenting the message of salvation to people. There is nothing more intimidating than jumping right in and saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to be one of those people in your life that makes it impossible to get to hell. Yep, you're going to have to get past me to get to the stupid decisions you want to make in your life. I am willing to get uncomfortable for you. How uncomfortable can it get? First of all, for everyone in this room, that you are the one that is going through the life change. Let me read you one of the coolest little scriptures you can find. It's not going to be up on the screen. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, you may want to write that down. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, it talks about this uncomfortableness. And listen to what he says. He says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. Okay. So Paul's coming in and saying, I've come in and I've preached. I've come in and I've told you the better plan that God has for your life. 
and it made you sorrowful that you weren't choosing God's plan in your life. Conviction. Everybody say conviction. Conviction, conviction took place. And Paul says this, I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Yeah. You were willing to get uncomfortable, and it turned the course of your life to then be able to step in the direction God wanted you to go. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world, that produces death. He's saying, listen, if you're sorrowful and you're walking in the Lord, that leads to life. But if you're sorrowful in the world and you stay there, it only leads to death. My question is, are you willing to get uncomfortable? And I would say, for God and his purpose and his chukmah, this has made me one of the greatest decisions you ever make in your life. The second group, is everybody in the room that you've become way too comfortable and you feel it. You feel it in your heart. You feel it down in your soul. i got to knock the rust off. Let me show you a picture. This picture is from a see you at the pole. The see you at the pole that took place this last week over all over the country where young men and young ladies in their school met, circled around their pole, and they prayed for their school, they prayed for their teachers, they prayed for their classmates, they prayed for themselves and God would use them. The reason this picture is such a big deal is because this is what it looks like when one kid out of the entire school shows up to pray for the school at their see at the pole. You want to talk about being uncomfortable for your school? You want to talk about having an edge? Having a choice? To just stay inside and no one will ever know? Or to be the only one to step out and to pray for your school? No one to hold hands with? To be the only kid that stood and prayed over his school that day? It's deeper than this. Let me read you the blog that went with this story. Stacy Philpot wrote in her blog this. The air on Facebook has been a bit toxic to me lately. So I announced I'd be taking a little hiatus. I needed some space between me and all the heated political discussion, the finger pointing and name calling. I look forward to the wide open space free from Facebook notifications. Can anybody relate? For this reason, a friend of mine knew I wouldn't see the thread in a local community group she tagged me in, and yet it was a tag I wouldn't want to miss. So she texted me a heads up. At first, I couldn't understand why she felt it was so vital I see this particular thread. It was a young man who stood alone that morning around his school's flagpole, praying in observance of the annual See at the Pole. Day for, the, uh, for the, uh, day for the students. Members of the community were chiming in, praising both the student and his parents. One man commented, I don't know who he, who he was, but his mom and daddy should be proud of him. That takes courage. He's obviously a young man with great character. As I scrolled through the picture, it hit me. That boy, the boy in the picture who stood alone at the pole, was my boy. They were talking about my son. A little boy I rocked to sleep in blue airplane pajamas when he was sick. The toddler who loved Elmo and couldn't go to sleep without holding his veggie tail characters in his hand had captured the attention of our community by standing alone, by doing everything we've ever taught him, everything we've ever hoped the, that he would Ado, I was completely undone. I read on through the thread, people who professed no faith at all commended my son for standing up for his, for, for his, 
Some folks said there are clearly still good parents out there. Can I pause for a moment and tell you how, really, how, how rarely I feel like a good parent? As someone who battles chronic illness, the sensation of failing is a constant in my life. There is never enough of me to go around. I never feel present enough. There is never a time which I can offer as much uh, for me and, uh, to my, uh, of me to my husband, to my children, to my community, and, and as I, as, uh, community as, as I long to. And yet strangers were praising my parenting. I text my son at school and told him, you should know that people in our community are going crazy about a young man who stood at a flagpole alone and prayed this morning. They're talking about how an amazing young man he must be and how proud his parents should be. And I want you to know that your parents are so proud of you. You're an amazing young man, and I love you so, so much. When Hayden came home from school with tears in his eyes, he read through the hundreds of comments. We read through the hundreds of comments together. He told me with sheer amazement in his voice that as he stood alone and prayed the cry of his heart, he had been praying, God, as people drive by, let them wonder. Let their hearts be pricked. He laughed and said it's crazy because it's like he answered in this big way. My son says at first he thought he would simply pray until someone else came along. And eventually, he realized no one else was coming along that day. And the cry of his heart changed and began to ask God that he would do something with him standing alone by the pole. So to you, whoever it is in your life you're, that you're standing alone, be it a flagpole, or maybe a marriage, a place of work, or a seemingly impossible situation, I believe my son would like to remind you that God can do big th things with your standing alone. Perhaps for now, you're praying until someone else shows up or, or takes notice, but God sees. He knows. And God can do big things. I thought that was pretty neat. But we seek people. We, we, we do our part. Sometimes it can get uncomfortable. and Conviction hurts. Sometimes standing alone does too. The last and final one is to make this soul Sunday complete. We can't forget to love. We seek. We do our part. We get uncomfortable. And we can't quit loving. In fact, we need to open our circle of love more. We need to love more. We need to love better. In fact, let me just remind you what Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says. It says, but the fruit, we were, remember we were talking about that a minute ago? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness. It's goodness. It's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You know what love causes us to do? It causes us to take a look at our sharpness. And maybe for some of you, this whole God thing just hasn't made sense. It's like, I, I know I should go to church. I know, I know we should read our Bible. I know I should pray. Stop. Stop. What did, what did God's love do for you? We sang an old song when I was growing up in church. Love lifted me. Remember that song? Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Remember that? And love, not only... Receiving love lifts you. But going back and being soul conscious, there is somebody who needs you. I don't care who you are. You may be brand new at this. Do you realize you could turn to your friends and say, how's your soul? 
How's your heart? How are you guys doing? What's it like being a newlywed? What's it like having your child? What has your attention? Where's your focus? Remember when we were so hungry to serve the Lord? Have we still got that hunger? And all of a sudden we begin to find we're not a part of the problem anymore. We're a part of the solution. To open our hearts to love brings the edge back. In this bucket today are the name tags at the beginning of the year we asked everybody to think of someone that God wants you to pray for this year. To check on this year. I wrote two names down. Can I be honest with you? These two names that are on these name tags have been on these two name tags for two years. And I've told Heather, I haven't seen these people take a step forward in their walk with Jesus. I've actually seen these people take a step backwards in their walk with Jesus. I have got to be the worst pray person in the whole wide world. I can preach from the pulpit, but when it comes to being a friend, I suck. That's how I feel. Well, the two people you've been praying for for two years, for two years, nothing, you've seen nothing take place in their life. <clears throat> this last weekend, I was invited to go run a 5K. Dumbest decision you could ever do. Don't ever run a 5K, okay? <laughs> Listen, just cut back on KFC, but don't run a 5K. <clears throat> but I had a blast. And I ran with all my friends and finished the 5K, came around, came up into the uh, uh, St. Helena's parking lot, and all my friends were waiting on me. And there, standing there, were two people who I knew very well. They were the mother and the father of the two people that I had been praying for for two years. These, this mother and father kind of pulled me aside, and we were standing there together. I said, how's the kids? I said, they're doing good. They're doing good. Man, the things are going great. I said, it's wonderful. It's so cool. And the mother turned to me, and she said, we got to get them in church. I mean, just like that. And the dad goes, yeah, we got to get them in church. And I said, you know, let me just stop you right there. Church isn't going to help them at all. Jesus is. And immediately the mom said, that's right. That's, and she punched the dad. I felt so sorry for him. She punched the dad. And she said, we've got to quit praying they go to church. We've got to start praying they know Jesus. And I said, that's what I've been praying for. The dad turned to me and said, and you've got to realize, this is two years I've seen nothing. Two years I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I've seen nothing. And the dad turned to me and he said, you pray for them. Do I tell them the story? Do I share with them right now, the mom and dad, something that I've only held private to my wife and nobody else, really? And I opened up my heart. And I turned to the dad of the two people I've been praying for, and I said this. I pray for them every day. He said, every day? I said, let me be more specific. In our church, there's this Jesus board and there's nails on it. We have these little big name tags, and I wrote both of their names on these, board, on these little tags. They're hanging up there right now, and I said, I can take you to them right now, because every day I pray over these tags. But every day on my way to CrossFit, there's these stoplights. When I get to the Walmart start, stop, stoplight, that is my signal that I start praying for them. And every morning at 4.50 every morning, I get to the stoplight and I start praying. I pray for him and I pray for her and I pray for him and I pray for her. And I turn left, okay? And I head down. And when I get to another certain stoplight, that's my time to stop. But every morning for the past two years, and I figured that's 300 days out of the year, so 600 times in over two years, plus times that we came together as a staff and prayed over the board, 600 times plus in two years, I have been praying for your son. And I have been praying for your daughter-in-law. And all of a sudden, I saw tears rise up in their eyes, and they realized they weren't in this alone that there was somebody else that God was using to be soul conscious, conscious for their kids. This is the story of how I came to Jesus too. 
someone wouldn't quit on me. This is the story of maybe how you're here today. Do you realize that if you're here for the very first time, or maybe the second time, six months ago and even a year ago, someone might have wrote your name on this little name tag. The names in here is pretty amazing. Most of them say mom. Most of them say dad. Some of them say son. Others say daughter. All kinds of different names, and I don't know any of them. But someone has been praying for you, or we've been praying for someone. Today we're going to do something to close up this series. And I'm going to put these across here. Because as a church, we're going to close with you coming and picking up however many number of names you'd like to come pick up. People you don't even know. And as you pray for them in the next few minutes in our church, as you exit, you're going to go back out on the Jesus board and hang them back up out there. We need to become soul conscious. It takes the rust off. It knocks the dust off. And it causes us to focus on the sweet spot of exactly what God wants to do. If you're here today and you'd like to join in in re-praying for these names, would you get up out of your seat? Come grab as many as you want. Let's do that now. We don't get them all, it's okay. We got other services. Y'all can come down the middle if you want. Swing around the middle. Just begin to pray for them. Allow Holy Spirit to coach on you. I truly believe that right there in your seat, there's going to be something that jumps up. As Holy Spirit says, pray for this for them. Pray for this too. Father, we love you. And today, Jesus, we pray for each and every one of these people. We pray that you would use them. Father, today we pray that the cloud would lift. Today we pray that the light would come in. And Jesus, today we pray that your voice would be crystal clear in their life. Father, we pray right now for a miracle to take place as, as walls fall, as gates are opened, and life is let in. Today, Jesus, I pray that as we're in this room, you would remind us of the importance of recognizing that being soul conscious is the wise way of living. Father, someone saw our soul as important. So now, Lord, show us a soul that needs to be encouraged. A soul that needs to be led. A soul that's worth getting uncomfortable for. Lord, we love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last and final thing. Maybe you're in this room. 
and you would say, my name needs to be on that tag. Maybe it is. And it would be a shame for you to leave the same way you walked in as when there's so many people right now who care about you and want what God wants for your life. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go walk right over here in this corner. Everybody that wants to talk to me, write me an email, okay? Because I really would like to talk to the, the, who is that person in the room that would say, I don't want to be the same person. I want Jesus. I choose him. I want what he wants for my life. Your life can change. Your soul can change in one decision. But we got to do that today. And so I'm just going to simply walk over here. And I would love for today to be your day that you choose the path that our Father has for you. We call it salvation. We call it repentance. We call it the victory over death to walk into life. Yeah. And you can have that today. So everybody's going to be moving out. Okay? Everybody that got a name tag, you're going to go over to the Jesus sign. You're going to hang the name tag back up. Do not take them home. Okay? And everybody else who would say, Ty, will you pray for me? I need Jesus. I would love to introduce you to the life everlasting that Jesus has for you. Just meet me over there. Now, for everybody that's here, I need some prayer. And our prayer team would love to pray for you. Just go to them. If everyone stand your feet. Cowboy Jones, we kick off a new series next week. It's going to be so much fun. I cannot wait. It's time for us to love God, love people, and have no limits in our life. I love you. Jesus loves you. Don't you ever forget it. God bless you guys, and have a great week in the Lord. See you later.